helps to have this. There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to uh, Patriots History. I'm Larry Swikart, mm -hmm. the co-author of Patriots History of the United States and uh, founder of wildworldofhistory.com. Just a word from our sponsor, which is me. Uh, if you don't know, we have a full curriculum that goes with Patriots History of the United States designed for grades 9 through 12, strongly recommended for grades 9 through 10. for reading through this book with you, right? It's 947 pages, of which, of course, 40 of those are notes, so you're not going to read those pages. So it's really only 900 pages. But still, that's quite a job for a kid to read. That's why we walk you through it. And each of the courses, but the U.S. course in particular, comes with 22 videos with me teaching the chapter with new material, not in the chapter, but with a lot of the ch stuff in the chapter for repetition. Uh, each video is 45 minutes to an hour long, comes complete with slides and backdrops, maps, images, charts, graphs, everything. And that's all yours. It's all part of the curriculum uh, for $199, as long as our convention sales prices last through mid-July. After that's Two ninety nine, might even be three nineteen. I'm not sure. We had to raise our prices. You know the Biden discount, which is add twenty percent to everything. That's in play. So anyway, um, if you're interested in the full curriculum, I have teachers' guides, student guides, tests, answer keys. Uh, the teachers get all of the prompts for the student, but all all the answers as well that go to those prompts. There's a built-in AP track. If your student is preparing to take the AP test, we get you ready for that, both in the text, in the reading, and in the tests, because we have the famous documents-based questions in the test, tests as well. Um, two semesters based on three hours instruction a week, includes the videos, Above and beyond that, I give you recommendations for outside movies. I'm a movie nut, so I give you between five and 10 movie recommendations or outside video recommendations for every unit. Now, you don't want to show the kid all of gangs in New York. You don't want to show them Cameron Diaz and Leonardo having sex. Ooh. But you want to show them the voting scene where they herd all the drunks down, tell them who to vote for, turn them around, shave them, put a different coat on them, and have them vote a second time, right? Vote fraud is nothing new in American history. So um, in addition to that, we have activities for every unit, at least one food cooking activity almost for every unit. For example, with the Wild West, it's get some buffalo meat and make buffalo burgers. So it's a great course. Nothing but love from the people who've who've taken this so far. They just really have enjoyed it. And uh, I've had parents say, you know, my kid wasn't ready, but I took it anyway and started to learn myself. Um, so take a look at that. It's on the website. Again, the convention price holds through about July 15th. Um, there is a code. And um, the world history course starts in 1775 and goes up to the present. It's really more of a modern world course. I don't get into Rome and Egypt and uh, the medieval period, all that stuff. Uh, but believe me, you'll have your hands full teaching Africa, Asia, Russia, Latin America, the Middle East, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Iraq War, all that stuff. Hitler, Napoleon, Churchill, FDR, Reagan, all the big names of the 20th and 21st centuries. So check those out. Again, that one comes with 15 videos. They're a little bit longer, still based on three hours a week, 16 weeks per semester, two semesters. Oh, and the last thing, both these courses have no license to expire. Got several kids coming up. You can use it with every one of them. 
it's yours. Once you get the course, it's yours. So take a look. Now, if you've already got Patriots History in the United States and you have the 15th anniversary edition, which is what you should have by now because the others are getting old. If you've got an older edition, replace it. If you got this edition, scroll down on the website, wildworldhistory.com to come to get the newsletter. And we'll send you a free copy of the updated 20th anniversary edition. Now, what this is, is a PDF of a brand new chapter I wrote from 2018 to 2023, <laughs> all those fun years, but also about 20 pages of inserts that will go in to the 15th anniversary edition book. I'll say after page 412, bottom of the second paragraph, add this. And it's new research and new material I've come across, right? So take a look at all of that. Uh, this is the time to get ready for the homeschooling season. Or if you're a public school or private school instructor, this is the curriculum you should be using. Yes, teach it yourself if you need to, but use the videos to help. Uh, it's, it's great stuff. It's deep. I won't kid you. There are other history programs out there that are neater looking. They're glossy. They have beautiful pictures and photographs and go, ooh, ah, nice glossy pages. They're, they're this deep. You're not going to learn why there's only two political parties, why the parties all gravitate toward the middle in American history, why government grows no matter which party is in power. This is all a part of the structure of American history, why we have four pillars that separate us from every other country in the world. Why it's so hard to pass legislation and change laws, things like that. So take a look. There's free samples on the website. All right, let's get started with our lesson today. Uh, by the way, I just came back from the Florida Parent Educators Association, biggest homeschool group in America or convention in America. And I met so many of you. I had so many come. We watch your YouTubes. I thank you all. I appreciate it. And um so we'll continue with today. We're in the chapter nine, Civil War chapter, <clears throat> and I am on page 335 of the um, 15th anniversary edition. Now, hang on one second while I check something. Okay, so what was I just doing? I was checking that update to make sure we didn't have anything that goes in this section and know the next inserted material, new research, comes on page 346. So you guys remind me, right, when we get there? All right. Okay, War in the West, last paragraph on page 333. While coastal combat determined the future of the blockade and control of the eastern port cities, and while the ground campaign in Virginia dragged on through a combination of McClellan's obsessive caution and Confederate defensive strategy, actions soon shifted to the Mississippi River region. Offensives in the West, where Confederates controlled Forts Donaldson and Henry on the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers, held the key to securing avenues into Tennessee and northern Alabama. Implementing the Anaconda Plan, you remember this was the idea that the Union would use its Navy to strangle the South by cutting off its, its uh, trade at the port cities and then would come down the Mississippi River. The Anaconda Plan drove down the Mississippi, then depended on wresting those important outposts from the rebels. General Ulysses Simpson Grant, an engineer from West Point who had fought in the Mexican War, emerged as a central figure in the West. This was surprising given that only a year earlier he had failed a series of professions, struggled with alcohol, and wallowed in debt. Grant took his Mexican War experience where he compiled a solid understanding of logistics as well as a strategy and applied his moral outrage over slavery to it. His father-in-law owned slaves, and James Longstreet, Lee's second-in-command at Gettysburg, was his wife's cousin and an army buddy. But Grant's own father had abolitionist tendencies, and he himself soon came to view slavery as a clear evil. When the Civil War came, Grant saw it not only as an opportunity for personal resurrection, but also as chastisement he thought that slave South had earned. He was commissioned a colonel in the Illinois Volunteers and worked his way up to Brigadier General in short order. Now, this is kind of ironic. 
because Grant turns out, as we will see, to be much more pragmatic, you might also even say merciful, than Sherman. Grant is not hated in the South. Well, most of that's dying out. But even today, there's pockets that hate Sherman. Sherman's name is still vilified in the South. But Grant, not so much. But Sherman didn't have the same kind of moralistic view of slavery that, that Grant did, which is interesting. Anyway, Grant did not take long to make his mark on the Confederates. Swinging down from Cairo, Illinois, in a great semicircle, he captured Paducah, Kentucky. Then, supported by a river flotilla of gunboats, he moved on the two Confederate river mouth fronts, forts, that guarded the entrance to the western part of the Confederacy. On February 6, 1862, Grant's land and river force took Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donaldson, the guardian of the Cumberland River, fell a few days later. When the fort's commander asked for terms, Grant responded grimly, unconditional and immediate surrender. Given the Army's penchant for nicknames, it was perhaps unavoidable that he soon became known as Unconditional Surrender Grant. Donaldson's capitulation genuinely reflected Grant's approach to the war. Find out where the enemy is, he said, and then, quote, get at him as soon as you can and strike him as hard as you can and keep moving on. How different is that from McClellan, who's prepare, 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 make sure there isn't anything you overlooked, hang on till every single thing is perfect. No, it didn't work that way. Grant's success laid open both Nashville and Memphis. Northern journalists, inordinately demoralized by Bull Run, swung unrealistically in the opposite direction after Grant's successes. The Chicago Tribune declared, quote, Chicago reeled mad with joy, and the New York Times predicted that, quote, the monster is already clutched and in its death struggle. <laughs> 1862, come on, man. Little did they know that the South was about to launch a major counterattack at a small church named Shiloh near Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee River. Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston knew by then, if he had not beforehand, the difficulty of the task confronting him. He had clung to a perimeter line almost 300 miles long, largely bordered by rivers fighting an opponent who commanded the waterways, while he had lacked sufficient railroads to counter in the rapid concentration of forces by the Union, counter the rapid concentration of forces by the Union at vulnerable points along the rivers. Now the South's reliance on river transportation as opposed to railways had come back to haunt the war effort. By the way, Grant's assault on uh, Fort Henry using uh, Navy gunboats was uh, the first what we call combined arms assault in human history. That is where you use two different forces to simultaneously uh, strike a foe. Uh, previously, because of the inaccuracy and lack of communications, you'd have the Navy pulverize something and then stop shooting so the infantry could land and, and invade um, because it took so long to get there and, and the accuracy was just horrible. But these uh, gunboats mounted these mortars that could fire up over the men and land inside the forts. And those were extremely uh, effective. Now, the British had done this in the Crimean War at Sebastopol, where they had these armored floating barges. I don't think they were steam powered. So that would still make the Monitor and the Merrimack the first steam powered ironclads to ever fight. Uh, but the barges the British used um, were iron protected for the, the mortars that they used to besiege Sebastopol. All right, let's continue. Rather than dig in, Johnston typically attacked. I mean, we, we already talked about this, right? Attack and die. This is kind of built into the Confederate psyche that you attack, attack, attack. Grant's troops were spread out while the general was planning the next part of his offensive. He had no defensive works, nor did he have any real lines of communication or supply. His headquarters was nine miles away on the other side of the Tennessee River. 
Although the troops at Shiloh and Pittsburgh Landing were the most raw recruits, they had the good fortune of being commanded by the able William Tecumseh Sherman. Early on in the morning of April 6, 1862, Confederate forces quietly marched through the fog nearly into the Yankee camp until warnings sounded and musket fire erupted. For the next six hours, the army slammed into each other at hurricane force with shocking casualties. In the peach orchard, both sides were blinded by a blossom snowstorm created by the din of rifle and cannon shot. By all accounts, the midday hours of Shiloh were the bloodiest of the war, with more Union and rebel bodies falling per minute than any other time in any other clash. Albert Sidney Johnson himself became a casualty, hit below and behind the knee by a musket ball, aides could not locate the wound, which was hidden by the high riding boots, and the unconscious Johnson died in their arms. By the way, many people think Johnson, uh, right behind Lee and Stonewall Jackson, was probably the third best commander in the entire Confederate Army. And many think had he lived, he not only would have won the Battle of Shiloh, but may have done much better in the West than all of the other generals, but what if? Who knows? Uh, AIDS could not locate the wound, which was hidden by the uh, by his high riding boots, and the unconscious Johnson died in their arms. Fighting at Shiloh ended on the first day with a Confederate advantage, but not a decisive victory. The Yanks found themselves literally backed up to the banks of the Tennessee River. General Lew Wallace, later famous for writing the book Ben-Hur, which became, of course, a very famous movie of Charlton Heston, finally arrived after confusing orders that had him futilely marching across Tennessee's countryside. General Don Carlos Buell arrived after steaming up the Tennessee River with 25,000 more men. Grant himself had come up from the rear ranks on the second day with reinforcements in place. The counterattack drove the rebels from the field and forced Johnston's successor, P.G.T. Beauregard, and if that's not a Southern name, P.G.T. Beauregard, to withdraw south to Corinth, Mississippi. It was a joyless victory given the carnage. Grant recalled he could, quote, walk, through, walk across a clearing in any direction, stepping on dead bodies without a foot touching the ground. Hideous. Uh, by the way, there were claims that uh, the reason Grant was taken by surprise was he was drunk. Not true. But this did cause Lincoln, these criticisms, these claims, caused Lincoln to send a spy out to Grant's headquarters and report on his drinking. And after some time, the spy reported back, no, he is never drunk while on duty, never drinks while engaged in combat or whatnot. And that report was in part what gave Lincoln the confidence to name Grant the general of all the Union armies. Uh, later um, but it was touch and go for a while Tennessee was opened in 1862 meanwhile Beauregard could not hope to hold Corinth against the combined forces of Pope, Grant, and Buell and therefore conducted a secret withdrawal that opened up northern Mississippi just two months earlier on April 1862 Commander David Farragut captured New Orleans and Memphis too had fallen now only Vicksburg stood between the Union and complete control of the Mississippi River. Vicksburg not only dominated the river, but it also linked the South to the Western Confederacy by rail. There, the blockade had been more porous, allowing food and horses to resupply rebel armies in the East. The story in the West seemed grimly monotonous. The Confederates would mount an offensive despite their supposedly defensive strategy, suffer proportionately greater losses, retreat, then escape as the Union commander dawdled. Union General William Rosecrans attacked Murfreesboro, Tennessee in December 1862. Again, the Confederates had to leave the field despite achieving a draw. Slowly but surely, the Confederates who took one step forward and two back yielded ground. For the remainder of 1862 and the first half of 1863, the Union failed to capture Vicksburg, which sat on a high bluff commanding a hairpin turn in the Mississippi River. Vicksburg's geography held the key to the city's nearly invulnerable position. The city sat on the eastern Mississippi side of the hairpin, while directly north of the hairpin lay the Chickasaw Bayou. 
The swamp was all but impenetrable for an army, as Sherman found out, calling the approach, quote, hopeless, unquote. A main road and rail line connected Vicksburg with Jackson, Mississippi. Grant's army tried a number of novel approaches to defeat the geography, including diverting the Mississippi River itself by constructing a canal and breaking a levee to create a channel from the Yazoo River. Nothing worked. Using Memphis as a base, however, Grant now decided to take Vicksburg by siege. Grant discarded traditional tactics and moved southward uh, through the Louisiana side of the river, through difficult bayous and lakes, to a point well below Vicksburg where he could recross from Louisiana into Mississippi. To do so, he needed the Union Navy, though, under Admiral David Porter, to make a critical run from above Vicksburg, past the powerful guns in the city, to the junction below, where it could ferry Grant's troops across. Porter sent dozens of supply boats past the city on the night of April 22, 1863. The Confederates had poured turpentine over bales of hay and set them afire to illuminate the river in order to bombard the passing vessels. Although most federal ships sustained damage, all but one survived the run. Uh, the federal ships also used hay bales and, and cotton bales uh, all over, sort of like today we have something called reactive armor on tanks. And it's when a shell hits, the armor kind of gives way and sucks up the shell, uh, allowing it to explode within the armor rather than within the, the tank. Uh, and that's sort of what they were doing here. Um Although most federal ships sustained damage, all but one survived the run. Grant's army now crossed into Mississippi from below Vicksburg, inserting itself between John Pemberton's forces in Vicksburg and Joe Johnson's army at Jackson. So now Grant has the Confederates split apart. Grant rapidly marched across the latter before Pemberton could discern his intentions, chasing Johnston out of the Mississippi capital quickly enough to turn on Pemberton and defeat him at Champion Hill as he came to A. Johnson's army. Vicksburg was totally isolated. So Grant here pulled a Napoleon. Napoleon was famous for the strategy of central position. So you see my two books back here. Get right in between those two books. Send a small force to hold off one, or if you can, defeat one quickly, then turn on the other. And that's exactly what Grant did here at the Siege of Vicksburg. Then from late May till July 1863, the Union Army bombarded and closed the noose around the city from the east. Civilians living in Vicksburg under constant fire had run out of normal food. When Grant sealed off the city, the residents took to caves and bombproof shelters. They ate soup boiled from mule and horse ears and tails before finally consuming the remaining parts of the beasts. When the horses and mules were gone, they ate rats. Sickness and disease swept the inhabitants as well as the soldiers. At last, on the 4th of July, 1863, Pemberton, unable to link up with Johnston outside the city, surrendered Vicksburg and its force of 30,000 starving soldiers. This is the largest surrender until Appomattox during the war, as well as 170 cannons just one day after the crushing defeat of Lee's army at Gettysburg. Grant said, quote, the fate of the Confederacy was sealed when Vicksburg fell. Lincoln had at last found what he needed to defeat the Confederacy. With eerie prescience, Lincoln told his advisors just before the news arrived from Vicksburg that if the general took the city, quote, Grant is my man and I am his for the rest of the war. One last interesting thing before we close today. Um, after Champion Hill, when Grant surrounded and started to besiege Vicksburg, <clears throat> he again, was very conscious of the lives of his men. Remember I showed you earlier that despite the fact they were supposedly fighting defensively, that the Confederates lost more men per men deployed in almost every battle than the Union did, um, percentage-wise. And um, Grant was very concerned about losing men. And so he wanted to just besiege the city. He says, let's just starve him out. It was his men that groused so much and demanded an attack on the city that Grant unwisely caved into their pressure 
and ordered an assault on Vicksburg, and it didn't go well. They lost a lot of men, and Grant said, I'm never going to do that again. That That's crazy. Well, turns out he did do it again um, at the Battle of the Crater uh, and at Cold Harbor uh, around Richmond. Uh, he forgot his own his own lesson of war, not to launch these full-scale frontal attacks against heavily defended areas. They're just suicidal. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you back here on um, Friday. And uh, until then, stay wild. <laughs>